Bible. Uh, this week we celebrated the biblical festival Shavuot. Hopefully many of you did and you connected to that festival during the week. Uh, Shavuot is one of the three major festivals that are what's referred to as pilgrimage feasts, where the Israelites made a mandatory journey to the temple when it was still standing in Jerusalem or Jerusalem. Um, you know, it's interesting because I've heard many Christians refer to the biblical festivals as Jewish festivals. Not something for Gentiles today. But what a loss. Biblical holidays unite us together in themes and in purpose. And for those of you who've been walking with this community for a while, we all completely experience that and know it. Although there are some differences in the expressions in these festivals uh, between Jews and Gentiles, they are for all followers of Yahweh. And they all connect to Yeshua. <clears throat> so biblical holidays bring a kind of rhythm of remembering. That's really my favorite phrase when it comes to celebrating the festivals and why we do. They are a rhythm of remembering to our lives. Through them we connect. We do it on a weekly basis on Shavos, which is what we're doing right now from sundown until sundown, when we enter into Sabbath rest. And then multiple times a year during major and minor holidays, which are Adonai's appointed time. So Shavuot has agricultural themes, as many of the festivals do, and the giving of the first fruits, which uh, that is what this looks like. It is called Bikurim, uh, which is the first fruits, and also two loaves of leavened bread, which look a little bit different than normal bread or challah bread. Some people say they look like bricks, and some people they say that they look like uh, a table. These are given to acknowledge that all are sustenance and all comes from him. Shavuot is also connected to the giving of the Torah, which is why we have our little Torah scrolls here um, this evening. In the Hebrew, Shavuot, pr the Shavuot prayer is the phrase Zaman Matan Toratenu. And what that means is it's the time of the giving of the Torah. So, if you have your um, Bibles in whatever form you have them, you can read this text with me. Um, we're going to start with Levitic Leviticus 23, verses 15 through 16. And again, I always use the complete Jewish version, uh, which you can find online at studylight.org. And um, you can pretty much find it anywhere if you Google it, but that's the version that we use. It says, from the day after the day of rest, that is from the day you bring the sheaf for waving. And that's what this looks like. They gather up this wheat and they wave it as an offering. <clears throat> that you bring the sheaf for wa waving. You are to count seven full weeks until the day after the seventh week. You are to count 50 days. And then you are to present a new grain offering to Adonai. So the biblical calendar begins in the spring with Passover. And then 50 days later, we come to Shavuot. Um, it marks the end of spring and the beginning of the summer harvest. Shavuot actually means weeks, weeks, W-E-E-K. And it commemorates the time when the Israelites stood at Mount Sinai to receive the Torah. That was seven weeks after they had Passover and they fled from Egypt. This counting of the days between Pesach, which is Passover, and Shavuot is called counting of the Omer. And that is an, a unit measure, the Omer. Then the 50th day is Shavuot. In between Passover, during the counting of the Omer, there is a journey of preparation to receive the word. And this was a time, an intentional time, to remove all psychological and spiritual barriers that would keep one from entering into hope and purpose and receiving. There is a great intentionality in this time, a great focus. Shavuot is a time to connect with both physical and spiritual harvest. Fifty days after Passover, the Israelites found themselves in the base of a mountain, awaiting the word of Yahweh. And this word would set their foundation for their community and their relationship with him. 
Keep in mind, they did not have a written word of God yet. <coughs> so when this happened, Moshe was on top of the mountain. And this is kind of an artist uh, rendering of this, but it was a giant mountain, Mount Sinai. Moshe was on top of the mountain receiving the word, and there was an extremely dramatic scene played out. So if you have your Bibles, you can read with me. Uh, we're going to take a look at Exodus 19, verses 16 through 9. And that is going to be on the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning and a thick cloud on the mountain. Then a shofar blast sounded so loudly that all the people in the camp trembled. Now, this is what a shofar looks like. This is a small one, small shofar. They come in all sizes and they're a ram's horn. Uh, and this sound that the text is talking about, I don't have it up here because it's too long. This sound that the text is talking about, this shofar sound is supernatural. But the people likened it to sounding like a shofar. Verse 17, Moshe brought the people out of the camp to meet God. They stood near the base of the mountain. And verse 18 says Mount Sinai was enveloped by smoke. So again, the people are here, this, the mountain goes up, and there is all smoke at the top. It goes on and says, because Adonai descended onto it in fire, its smoke went up like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain shook violently. Verse 19 says, as the sound of the shofar grew louder and louder, Moshe spoke. And God answered him with a voice. So this is a spectacular event. There are so many meaningful images in here. And I'm very excited about what I want to share with you tonight. We're going to get into some of them. We could literally talk for a year about all the images. Let's look first at the marriage covenant seen here in the Talmud. <clears throat> the, sh the Shavuot is often referred to as marriage day. Uh, and that is the marriage day between Israel and Yahweh. Let's look at three connections to the covenant of marriage. First, there is a thick cloud on the, on the mountain. There is the giving of the Torah that will be in a written form. And there are vows surrounding the receiving of the Torah. So let's just break down those three things about how they connect to vows, covenant, writing and smoke. The first thing is the cloud. The cloud covers the mountain, which we can see here, and the people stand under it. Now, this is remembered and expressed today, tra traditionally, through the chopa, which couples stand under in their weddings. And that looks, well, there's all kinds of expressions of the chopa, but it looks like this. When couples get married, as you know, you may have seen this or you may have done this, they stand over a hopa, and where the hopa is connected to is Mount Sinai. The second thing we see is the written Torah. Now, the ketubah ceremony is an ancient custom of signing a written agreement between the bride and the groom. That agreement is legally binding. It's called a betrothal, and it actually happens even before the vows are exchanged. And by the way, Mary and Joseph were betrothed. So it's kind of a legally binding engagement. And obviously that is seen with the giving of the writing of these vows that were about ready to be exchanged. The writing of the instruction. And third is the vows to live out of this agreement. So this communal entering into these instructions from Adonai are not an agreed upon contract. And I want you to see the difference between a contract and what was happening with the people of God and God giving them these written instructions in which to live out of. Rather, the accepting of that which one builds a foundation of trust on, that's a covenant. And so God gives them these writings, these instructions, as they are sort of his bride and he is the bridegroom. And here's how they respond. And this is where we see the vow. <clears throat> In Exodus 24, 7, which we see here, 
It says, then he took the book of the covenant and read it aloud so that the people could hear. And they responded, everything that Adonai has spoken, Naisa Venishima. Now, I want you to see something very interesting here, and I'm, I'm hoping you can see it well. At the end, it says, so the Lord gives them this. It's read out loud, and their response is, everything that Adonai has spoken, Naisa Venishima. And that is Hebrew for, we will do, and we will hear. Now, do you see something strange in that order? We will do, and we will hear. How, how do you do before you hear? That's very un-Western Greek-like, right? It's, it's, it's mixed up. It's backwards. Usually you hear first, and then you agree to it, and then you do it. But they say we will do first, and then we will hear. Scholars have written much about this wording, but this is intentional writing that shows the hearts of the people as they receive the word of God. They did not view this as a contract. It wasn't reading to make sure I'm okay with what I signed first before I agree. <clears throat> this doing before hearing has to do completely with trust and covenant. As Abraham Heschel describes this, it is not a leap of faith, but a leap of actions. So these vows are an I do, not an I will if. So for those of you who are married and you exchange vows, you didn't say, well, I will do this and I promise to do this if you do this and this and this. They're unconditional vows based on trust and covenant. And they are not an if and then just like the vows exchanged in a wedding. So we see these connections here that the Lord also even makes himself with this experience. Jeremiah 2.2 says, I remember your devotion when you were young, how as a bride you loved me, how you followed me through the desert, through a land not sown. And this is the Lord speaking to his people of Israel. So even God is making the connections with the marriage covenant. Among many things, this is a picture of covenant between the Lord and his people, and that covenant is sealed with the giving of his word. Now, something miraculous also happened later. So first we see this very dramatic scene played out with the people and with rumbling and with voices and with light and with fire and with clouds and with all this symbolism of marriage, of the people and the bridegroom. And then we see something later on, on this very holiday, Shavuot, with the followers of Yeshua. As all of the New Testament, the Brit Kadasha, it is connected with the Tanakh. It is not separate. A lot of people try to separate the two, and when they do, they miss out on the rich connection. It was 50 days after the resurrection of their teacher. His disciples were gathered together, and they were kind of afraid too. And there are bride and bridegroom connections with this relationship as well, with Jesus and his followers. But why were the disciples gathered together? The church teaches that they were gathered together in Acts chapter 2 because they were waiting for the gift that Jesus promised them. Okay, you could say maybe they were, but they were specifically there for the participation in the festival Shavuot. The disciples were gathered together to celebrate the giving of the word, which was on the 50th day. We see this story in Acts 2, and it was most definitely not a standalone event. It was not a replacement event. It was a fulfilling event. There were intentional narrative threads to connect all of the people involved to Shavuot. This was the fulfillment of the giving of the word to the world through Yeshua. So let's circle back to Mount Sinai so we can see these amazing connections. <clears throat> in Exodus 20, verse 18, it says, All the people experienced the thunder, the lightning, the sound or voices of the shofar and the mountain smoking. 
When the people saw it, they trembled, standing at a distance. So now there are a lot of commentaries on this. They're called, they're extra biblical writings. One of those is the Midrash. And in the Midrash, Shemot 5.9, it is talking about this event. And here is how rabbis sort of explain it. Here's how the oral tradition was carried out through the years. It says, the whole nation perceived thunderings. The voice emerged and became 70 voices and languages so that all nations could hear. So what the Midrash says is at this event, when the people were gathered at this mountain and heard these noises, that the voice emerged as 70 voices in the languages so that all the nations could hear. 70 representing all of the languages. <clears throat> Interesting. In the book, The Midrash, uh, what The Midrash says, Rabbi Moshe Weissman writes, in the occasion of Matan Torah, which is the giving of the Torah, the B'nai Yisrael, that's the children of Israel, not only heard Hashem's voice, but actually saw the sound waves as they emerged from Hashem's mouth. They visualized them as a fiery substance. Each commandment that left Hashem's, the Lord's mouth, traveled around the entire camp and then to each Jew individually, asking him, do you accept upon yourself this commandment pertain and pert pertaining the laws to it? And every Jew answered, yes. Finally, the fiery substance, which, they, which was on them, went back to the tablets and engraved the law on the tablets. What amazing connections there. What we see in Acts 2 is a messianic fulfillment. You see, these extra biblical writings were shared oral stories that came throughout the years about the experience of Mount Sinai. And it doesn't matter about whether these stories happened or not. What matters is that Yahweh is making intentional connections to these stories so that everyone who was present or everyone who reads about this Acts 2 experience connects what happens in the second chapter of Acts with the tongues of fire and the language to be heard with the Midrashic story of Mount Sinai. Let's read Acts 2, 1 through 4 together. <clears throat> the festival of Shavuot arrived, and the believers all gathered together in one place. And then in verse 2, it says, Suddenly there came a sound from the sky like the roar of a violent wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then they saw what looked like tongues of fire, which separated and came to rest on each one of them. Does that sound familiar? Verse 4, they were all filled with the Ruach HaKadosh, which is the Holy Spirit, and began to speak in different languages as the Spirit enabled them to speak. So you see here, it's the same thing. <clears throat> Acts chapter 2 and Mount Sinai. And they both happened on Shavuot. There was sound, there was wind, there was fire. And the text will go on to say the people around them would hear them praising the Lord in their own native languages. Again, this directly connects to what happened on the mountain. Yeshua was the word manifested, given, so the whole world would hear. And this receiving of the word through the Spirit brought power in order to equip Yeshua's followers to do, to bring good news, and to do mitzvah that would change the world. Shavuot. Why would we ever want to neglect the remembering of this holiday? We too have been given this gift. And it is the time to remember, to connect, and to share this gift with the world. The Amido prayer for Shavuot is, and you, our God, gave us with love appointed festivals for gladness, festivals and times for joy. This day of the festival of Shavuot, the time of the giving of the Torah. 
And this is what we celebrated this week. We're going to close this time <clears throat> with the lighting of the candles. And these are Shavos candles. And traditionally, the mother usually lights the candles. And these separate uh, what the Sabbath light of peace and joy and unity in the home. And then the mother traditionally encircles her hands over the candles three times, which is a gesture of welcoming in the Sabbath. And then she prays as she covers her eyes from the flame as a symbol of ending all work. Blessed are you, Yahweh our God, King of the universe, who set us apart by his commandments, who has given us Yeshua the Messiah, and has set us to be a light in the world. Amen.